This will be the first of two lectures on the historian and philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to cover Kuhn's thoughts on, on normal science and what are generally considered to be his, his less radical positions on things. And the second lecture will focus more on the, uh, the, the more extreme claims that he makes. Kuhn is focusing on an aspect of the philosophy of science that uh, I have not really been focusing on so far in this series too much, namely the historical development of scientific theories. How is it that scientific ideas come about? How is it that they challenge one another? What is it that makes one idea ultimately deemed to be a better idea than competing ideas um, and that sort of thing? Uh, I've been up to this point been looking primarily at what's often called the context of justification because that's principally what thinkers like the logical positivists and Karl Popper were interested in. The context of justification asks about what is it that legitimizes or establishes a scientific idea? What is it that shows that it stands up to scrutiny? Um, the, the context of discovery, which is more what Kuhn is interested in, uh, focuses instead on what it is that makes scientific ideas come about in the heads of scientists, how do they mature, how do they develop, uh, what is it that leads to them being tested in the ways that they are, and sort of the ultimate acceptance or rejection of those ideas by the scientific community. That's the, the uh, something that the, po the positivists and Popper were not particularly interested in. Kuhn wants to argue that philosophers of science need to pay a lot more attention to the context of discovery if they are actually going to understand how science works in the real world. Kuhn got his start uh, as a physicist, uh, but he was also a physicist who was interested in uh, the history of science. And he noticed that most of uh, his teachers who taught him science presented a picture of science that looked, well, something kind of like this, you know, a roughly sort of upward linear curve. Ancient Greek, ancient Roman scientists down here in the beginning, and then things sort of leveled out around medieval times, a little, you know, less, less scientific advancement there. And then the Renaissance comes along and things get moving again, you get more scientific development, and then up until the Enlightenment uh, and on through in the modern day, and we just sort of progressively accumulate more and more scientific knowledge. This is a picture which was... Uh, a, pioneered mostly during the Enlightenment, this idea that, that scientific advancement was constantly moving forward into new territory when we were just constantly learning more and more things. Science was a purely rational endeavor uh, that makes persistent uh, but gradual uh, progress towards knowing more and more and more. And it's a, in a more or less straight line. This is a picture of the development of science, which Kuhn found to be completely artificial. When he actually looked back at the history of science, he saw that it looked nothing at all like this picture. It's, when you actually look at how science uh, develops, you'll see that the history of science is filled with dead ends and false starts and contradictions. Uh, ideas which are popular for a very long time end up blowing up and leading nowhere. Um, you know, some, there's, there's, there's scientific fraud that can go for a very long time. There's, there's mistakes that very intelligent people make, and oftentimes you have to just go back to the old drawing board. It's nowhere near this sort of gradual picture of continuous progress that the Enlightenment uh, was suggesting and that had infected science class classrooms in his youth and to a certain extent even a few decades after he worked. So what, what Kuhn decided to do was set out to draw a more historically accurate and realistic picture of how it is that science develops over time. And that's what's at the core of his seminal book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Now, uh, you know, I make a lot of sort of suggestions and recommendations uh, in this series, but this is going to be one of these sort of just un unqualified recommendations. Read this book. If you have any interest in the history and philosophy of science, if you have any interest in science, if you have any interest in the history of ideas, or for that matter, just general intellectual work in the 20th century, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions is an absolute must read. It's just had its 50th anniversary edition printing. Uh, it was originally published in 1963. And this is easily, without a doubt, one of the most influential books of the 20th century. Uh, um, it, it obviously is focused principally on, on the history of science, but it ends up having ramifications well beyond just history and philosophy of science. Um, there was a study done several years ago, I can't remember off the top of my head who did it or where it was published, uh, but it found that, that, that Kuhn's work had been, published, had been cited more times in the second half of the 20th century than even uh, people like Freud and Marx. And that means that intellectuals and academics and scholars have been deeply, deeply impressed with the work of Thomas Kuhn. Once more, that's not to say that they all agree with him, of course. There's a lot of disagreement about how to interpret him and about uh, how to take what he says seriously or not too seriously. But, but everyone recognizes that what Kuhn did was a radical change in how we think about the history of science and how we teach the history of science.
Key to his conception of how science works are, are two concepts that he calls paradigms and normal science. Kuhn, like I said, was a trained scientist. He, he had a degree in physics, and he noted that most day-to-day -day science is frankly kind of quotidian. It's, it's peaceful. It's not terribly eventful. The scientist goes into the lab, and they tinker with this, and they tinker with that. They go about what we would call problem solving. And it's a sort of boring, if you will, process that, that, that Kuhn calls normal science. Uh, normal science it happens under the auspices of a sort of general broad set of unquestioned assumptions about what to expect that day when you go into the lab. Contrary to the sort of picture that you get with Popper, where if, if everyone were real Popperians, they'd be going into the lab every day ho saying, okay, I'm going to prove the theory of relativity is wrong today. And that just really doesn't happen, at least not very much. Most of the time, scientists go and they just sort of, they assume the theory of relativity is correct because that's the dominant paradigm. The paradigm governs the sorts of questions that you ask and the sorts of questions that you ignore. It governs how those questions are investigated, what, what sorts of uh, uh, tools you use to determine whether or not this particular experiment is going to work out this way or that way. And it, it governs how you interpret the results of those experiments. If you, had, if you didn't have the paradigm governing how you go about doing these things, it would be incredibly confusing and complicated, possibly even impossibly complicated and confusing. You need the paradigm to instruct you and to guide you into how to go about doing science on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, some examples of, of, of classical paradigms that Kuhn points to is you, you can look at the difference between Aristotelian physics versus Newtonian physics versus Einsteinian physics. Uh, all, all three of these paradigms uh, dominated for quite some time, Aristotelian probably for the longest time, uh, for over about 2,000 years, and then the Newtonian paradigm for about 250, 300 years or so, and then Einstein for about the last century. Um, but, but if you were doing science in any of these time periods, you were governed by that dominant paradigm. You, you operated under an assumption that that paradigm was the truth. Um, another example that he points to is the difference between Aristotelian biology, which is uh, generally considered to be kind of essentialist, the idea that, you know, that, that species are eternal and unchanging, versus you know, Darwinian biology, which of course says that species uh, evolve gradually over time. Uh, now, which of these paradigms you accept will radically alter the way you go about doing science on a day-to-day -day basis, the way you do your normal science? I think it's important to distinguish here between two senses of the word paradigm. There's a broad sense and there's a narrow sense. I've been talking up to now sort of about the broad sense of the word paradigm, this sort of pervasive framework which governs and controls how people see and interpret the world in which they live. In the original edition of Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Kuhn also used the word paradigm in a narrower sense, um, which would he would point to like a paradigm example or a, a paradigm case. So it would be like a specific achievement that would exemplify or illustrate uh, the, the broader sense of the word paradigm. So Newton's laws of motion, for example, would be a paradigm of uh, uh, Newtonian physics. Thankfully, in later editions, he kind of caught on that that was probably kind of confusing. He started instead using the term exemplar a little bit more. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to sort of use the term exemplar to, to refer to, to, to that second sense, the narrower sense, an exemplar of the paradigm, narrow sense of the word paradigm, whereas the paradigm in the broad sense, I will use the proper term paradigm for. So hopefully that will avoid any confusion. The picture of normal science that you get from Popper makes it seem to be this sort of heroic endeavor that, that scientists are constantly going in every day ready for battle tr trying to falsify the dominant ideas but that's again that's just inaccurate that's not the way it works for most scientists most days of the week average day in the lab is slow and boring full of tedious repetitive labor and it's only once in a great long while that you get really unexpected results that you that might potentially falsify your, your paradigm um, instead most of the time, the scientist understands that they're going to go in and perform an experiment and then leave the lab, and nothing radical is going to happen. Nothing's going to be falsified. Nothing's going to be massively changed. What Kuhn calls this, this normal science period, he says it's dedicated fundamentally to solving puzzles. Here's a little thing that we don't yet know and, and we can't yet explain in terms of the paradigm. Here's a, a question that we have. How did this particular feature of this particular animal evolve, for example? What were the selective pressures that led to it coming about? And he compares it to a crossword puzzle. He says, you know, in a crossword puzzle, we know that there is a solution to the crossword. You know, we, we may not know what it is just by looking at it. We might have to think. But we understand that crosswords follow certain rules. And if we follow those rules, too, and we use a little bit of our imagination, we can be guaranteed to find the solution. And likewise, 
the paradigm gives us these rules. If we sort of use our imagination a little bit within those rules, it will provide us with a solution to these puzzles. Now, so long as there are no real problems, no real threats to the paradigm, so long as there's only these little puzzles, normal science continues apace pretty much every single day. Now, every once in a while, you'll get a strange result, and you go, huh, that's odd. But you don't immediately, like Popper suggests, sort of run out and throw out the whole paradigm, throw out the whole theory. You sort of say, well, I probably overlooked something. And you run the experiment again, and you see, oh, yes, of course, I forgot to properly calibrate my instrument or something like that. Um, and that's the, pr the business of normal science, just sort of to preserve the paradigm and keep working within the paradigm. But inevitably, in any scientific endeavor, anomalies will begin to develop and accumulate. Most of them will get explained away, but some of them will stick around. Um, by their nature, all paradigms develop anomalies. Uh, and these are just results that don't conform to or cannot be immediately explained by the current paradigm. This is not a problem most of the time because scientists sort of assume that they made a mistake somewhere, that the anomaly is a result of human error. Now, I've used this phrase before, but it's crucial for Kuhn and it's crucial for understanding how science actually works. According to Kuhn, anomalies are not counterexamples. That is absolutely essential to understanding how science works. If they were, any time you have an anomaly, you'd have to throw out everything. But that would be foolish. That would be total baby with the bathwater action. We, any practicing scientist understands that you get an anomaly once in a while, but most of the time it's because of some unaccounted for variable. Experiment was poorly structured or something like that. Um, and they go back and they fix it, and most of the time they can dissolve the anomaly in a way that's perfectly consistent with the paradigm. But on rare occasions, those anomalies won't disappear. They'll run the experiment again, and the anomaly will persist. And they'll, so they'll, 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 they'll get a friend at a lab to try to run the experiment, and, and, and he'll notice that the, he can't get the anomaly to disappear either. So they most of the time when this happens, they just ignore it. They say, ah, uh huh, I don't know what's going on here. But I've got better things to do. I've got a research agenda I'm committed to. I'm not going to suddenly start breaking away. Maybe I'll give this to a grad student or, or an intern or something like that a little bit later on. And they, they shelve it and they walk away from it. Um, and they don't tend to think about it too much. Another strategy that Kuhn points out is oftentimes they'll just sort of relegate it to another discipline. They'll say, oh, well, you know, this isn't really a problem for physics. This is more of a chemistry sort of thing. So there's no wonder I'm getting the anomaly. That's not, I'm not, I'm not a chemist, I'm a physicist. So uh, maybe I'll mention it to my chemist friends and, I'll, if, and if they want to deal with it, they can deal with it. Uh, but I'm not going to bother with it. And sometimes it just takes a little bit longer to explain it away in terms of the paradigm. Sometimes it takes a couple of years or whatever, and then someone else will come along and publish an article, and that, that scientist will read it and go, oh, that accounts for the anomaly that I had in that experiment a few years back. That's right, it all makes sense now. So there's a number of things that can happen to these anomalies over time. Uh, but of course, the tricky thing is what happens when they continue to accumulate and never go away. When you can't explain away the anomaly, that's when their combined strength starts to push scientists out of that state of normal science and into something that Kuhn calls crisis science. Now, in, the, in crisis science, the current paradigm is not immediately rejected. It's not just thrown out the way Popper suggests it does. Instead, it starts to be seen as inadequate. People start to recognize publicly that the dominant paradigm cannot really account for all these things that we're seeing. And scientists start to wonder out loud and to each other, is there a better paradigm to be had? Now, oftentimes you will sit around for, for years, even decades, uh, in this state of crisis science where you cannot explain away all this data. It's only when a new paradigm begins to emerge that the old one ends up being rejected. So, so scientists, according to Kuhn, will hold on to a bad paradigm rather than have no paradigm at all. They, even if they know the paradigm is flawed, even if they know it's fatally flawed, they do not throw it out until something better comes along. One of the best illustrations of this is the, is the Michelson-Morley experiment and the, the, the role that Albert Einstein played in, in creating the new paradigm that accounted for this information. Now, I could explain to you the Michelson-Morley experiment, but fr quite frankly, I think it's probably better if I hand things over to Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is, of course, both more entertaining and more qualified than me to explain the details of this experiment. There are only a handful of experiments in physics that completely transformed physics at many people's top of the list would have to be the Michelson-Morley experiment. In the 19th century, physicists thought that since sound waves travel through air, light waves must travel through some sort of medium as well. 
They called this theoretical medium ether. The famous luminiferous ether, this magical medium that was hypothesized to be what light required to move through the vacuum of space, just the way sound requires air to move from one place to another. How else could waves of light move through the vacuum of space unless there was some medium there, some hypothetical medium, let's call it the ether. Ether, they theorized, is an invisible nothingness that permeates the universe. Its only physical property is that it allows light to propagate through it. But once precise measurements of the speed of light became possible, testing the predicted effects of ether on the speed of light became possible as well. The Earth orbits the Sun at about 66,500 miles per hour. If light travels through ether, they reasoned, then as the Earth moves through the ether, the speed of light should be different going with the ether than perpendicular to it. Compared to the speed of light, Earth is not moving that fast. So if you're going to check the difference in the speed of light measured with the movement of the Earth compared with transverse to it, you need a level of precision that, was, that, that no one had before. The Michelson interferometer was just such an apparatus. Michelson and Morley devised an apparatus that would detect minute differences in speed between two beams of light. Light from one source is split into two directions through a half-silvered mirror. These beams are bounced between other mirrors and then recombined back into a single beam. When two light beams combine, if their waves are completely synchronized, the peaks combine to make an even more intense peak. If they are one half wavelength off, their peaks combine and cancel out the intensity. Slight differences in speed between two light waves will therefore produce a pattern based on the amount of interference between the two beams. This is known as an interference pattern. Examining the interference pattern from the two light beams sent out in different directions would clearly show if the speed of each light beam were different in different directions. But Michelson and Morley never detected such a difference. Their results were inconsistent with the existence of ether. The scientific world didn't know what to make of it. The, the famous scientists in Europe, all uh, Lord Rayleigh and Lord Kelvin and Lord Thompson, we're saying, hey, come on, you must have done something wrong here. Uh, there has to be an ether. And the whole thing didn't get resolved until many, many years later when Einstein came along. Einstein's theory of special relativity proposed that the speed of light is always the same, regardless of the speed of the light source. The results of the Michelson-Morley experiment were entirely consistent with Einstein's view of the universe. And this served as the turning point in modern physics. The Michelson-Morley experiment was an experimental advance in technology that transformed science. Not only physics, but science. Okay, a couple of key things there for Kuhn's purposes. First, note that the Michelson-Morley experiment starts off as an anomaly. It, it isn't something that immediately destroys the theory of the ether in the eyes of the scientific community. It's, it looks like something was probably done wrong. The rest of the scientific community said, no, you guys had to have screwed up somewhere because all the evidence does suggest that there is an ether. That was the paradigm by which people understood the process of, of light propagation. And it was, almost, it was about two decades between the Michelson-Morley experiment and Albert Einstein coming up with the, the theory of relativity that allowed the old the ether paradigm to be through thrown out and replaced with with a relativity paradigm and that process that that two decade process was a, a, an excellent example of Kuhn's notion of crisis science because gradually people started to realize that it wasn't just an anomaly this was a genuine counterexample but once more contra popper they did not simply throw out the ether a paradigm because that would have left them totally freeform. They wouldn't have known what to do. It, uh, many scientists wanted to hold on to the ether paradigm and they had good scientific reasons for doing so. It wasn't until much later that finally that Einstein comes along and really sort of uh, convinces everybody to switch over to the relativistic paradigm. Okay, so that whole process there is called a paradigm shift, a shift away from the luminiferous ether uh, uh, paradigm and towards the Einsteinian paradigm of understanding how light works. And the process as a whole, the whole, again, the, the normal science, the accumulation of anomalies, the, the shifting into crisis science, and then having the paradigm shift, that whole process is what Kuhn calls a scientific revolution. 